Gracious God, we thank you for this day and this opportunity, excuse me, to learn holy things. Guide and direct us by the power of your Holy Spirit and teach us today that it will make us wise in the salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're going to continue on with the uh, Catechism and the Commandments of the Catechism. Uh, so if you need a hymnal, if you're near, not nearby one or whatever, and I don't know that the uh, Royces are going to be with us today because they have family in from out of town, so I'll, I'll borrow their hymnal. Or wait, you need that hymnal, so I'll use this hymnal. Okay. And I keep forgetting what page this is on, but we'll go 321. 321. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I know because mine was already marked. There you go. Well, you know, I mean, that's that's the way I roll. So <laughs> I need help. You know, I, I need lay people help because if I don't get it, you see what happens. I mean, that's... Um, so we, we had talked about the second commandment. And I demonstrated how, a couple things, how it's memorized, so we should fear and love God. It always starts out that way because it aids in memorization. We demonstrated the two types of sin, original and actual. And I also uh, showed you how original or, or no, actual sins of omission and commission are covered in these, uh, these definitions, these explanations, as Dr. Luther calls them. And also demonstrated how these commandments serve as a heading for deeper topics. So we categorize all of Christian morality under one of the Ten Commandments. It's, it's somewhat arbitrary, of course, sort of like when we did the Apostles' Creed. We had an article for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, and we put all of theology under one of three headings. And of course, when you're dealing with God, that is a little, um, you know, because the whole Trinity is involved in creation, redemption, and sanctification. But for the sake of knowing which book you're going to read when you've got your three volumes of doctrine on the shelf, you know which one to pull off or which topic, we categorize things that way. And that is... Um, that is how we have traditionally done things in the church, so much so that my wife, who went to a Wesleyan seminary, you know, she was a Methodist minister when I met her, so I'm one of those crazy kinds of Lutherans. Um, <laughs> you know, this, you know, they, I, I, how I got through the system, I have no idea in the Missouri <laughs> Synod, because not only do we not like Methodists, we don't ordain women, so, you know, it's like, so here I go and I marry a United Methodist minister. I mean, that's the God thing right there. Um, but I'll, she's not here, so I'll let her speak for herself on some of these topics. Um, but when she went through seminary, she had a three-volume dogmatics text, too, written by a different author, of course, a Methodist, as opposed to a Lutheran. But it was three volumes. One was for the Father, one was for the Son, one was for the Holy Spirit, just like mine. That's how we categorize doctrine traditionally in the church. Well, the commandments are how we categorize morality traditionally in the church. So let's move on then to the third commandment, uh, page 321, first column, that, uh, down the paragraph there, third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? Again, Luther's explanation. We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Why on earth did he come up with that? Because as you know, the Sabbath is a Saturday. It's the seventh day of the week. In six days God created, he rested on the seventh, he sanctified the seventh day of the week, and he asked his people to do the same when he was delivering the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. And so, you know, why on earth then do we worship on Sunday? Well, you know, it's because the Roman emperor came along and he decided we need to worship the sun instead of the true God, Jesus. And so he changed the worship day to Sunday. That's some of the, um, that's some of the things that are going around on the internet, but it's just simply not true. The reason Christians started worshiping on the first day of the week and this goes back to biblical times. On the first day of the week, we have Paul referencing people setting aside to some in worship on the first day of the week. The first day of the week is the day that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. And so we naturally started doing our worship, therefore, on the day of Jesus' resurrection. So in Christian thinking, every Sunday and worshiping on a Sunday is like having a mini, mini Easter Sunday service. You see how that works? We're acknowledging that he rose on the third day, which was the first day of the week. So it's not that you cannot worship on Saturday. It's not that it's a bad idea to worship on Saturday. The Seventh-day Adventists like to worship on Saturday. Good for them, knock themselves out. People have asked me if we can have Saturday night services. I would love to do that if I could get enough of a crowd together to do that. You know, all this sort of stuff. But with Jesus coming, with his life, death, and resurrection... He fulfilled the ceremonial 
aspect of Old Testament law. So we are no longer bound to it. This is why we also don't offer animal sacrifices. Because Jesus was the sacrifice. All of the animal sacrifices, all of the temple ritual, everything that went into Jewish practice prior to the coming of Jesus ceased when Jesus died on the cross. And if you read the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see that God ceased it. What happened? The sun was darkened. There was an earthquake. The curtain in the temple that separates the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. The Holy of Holies is where God was. The Holy of Holies was that space that the priest was only allowed to enter once a year. The thinking was that if you entered it and you were unauthorized, God would strike you dead. And why would he not? He was striking people dead for touching the ark, right? So you go into the Holy of Holies unauthorized. Or if God did not accept the sacrifice, he might strike the priest dead. That's why a lot of priests went in with a rope tied around their ankle. In case they died in there because God was not happy with the nation, they could yank him back out. I wondered then, that must be a really nasty place if nobody ever goes in there except once a year and with an animal sacrifice. How did they clean that place? Well, it turns you know how they clean that place? They had scaffolding. They moved into there so they would walk on the scaffolding and not on the ground in there. Weird, huh? But that's the way they handled this stuff. So here's this curtain separating the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. Jesus dies, sun is darkened, earthquake happens, the temple curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. It's like God reached down and said, we're done with this stuff now. <laughs> Show's over. My son is dead. Okay, everything has been fulfilled. We're doing something different now. So Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament sacrifices. Remember the threefold office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king. He is the quintessential priest in that he not only offers the final sacrifice for sins, he is the final sacrifice for sins. And of course, in Matthew, we read that many dead people were walking around too and were seen in Jerusalem. The graves of many holy people were open when Jesus died. Can you imagine what that must have been like living in Jerusalem? You got an eclipse, you got an earthquake, you got the temple curtain torn in clue, you got the centurion saying, surely this is the Son of God. You got all the hubbub of Jesus. And oh, look, there's a dead person walking. Isn't that that lady who was in the temple the other day? Yeah, she died, didn't he? No, there she goes. Hey, how are you doing? You dead? Yeah, I was dead, but I'm back now. Hey, you know, I'm going to go talk to Lazarus, see how he's doing about this. Because I mean, you know, stuff like that. Can you imagine living with that? And what do we learn from that? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the powers that be, the Sanhedrin, still tried to repress Christianity. They still tried to repress the truth. And what I take away from that when I preach is seeing is not always believing. Because you can see Jesus doing Jesus things and still harden your heart like many people did and like many people do today. But that is why we worship on Sundays in the Christian church. We don't consider this more sacred than any other day. But by moving our worship from Saturday to Sunday, we are acknowledging the resurrection of Christ. Now, the ceremonial law no longer applies to us. The moral law still does, which is why we're learning it. And so, since the ceremonial law still doesn't apply to us, but the moral law does... Dr. Luther writes, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. What that means is we honor the Sabbath day as Christians nowadays by setting aside time in our lives to study holy things, to go to church, to worship, to be in Bible study, to do our own private devotions, you know, whatever it takes. We are marking a set time in our lives to be with God to slow down the rest of our life and study his word. Now you can do that literally on a Saturday if you want to. You know, that's, you know, if you want to be literal about it, and I've done this from time to time just for my own personal whatever, you know, from sunset Friday to sunset Saturday. That's how the Jews mark times from sunset to sunset. You can keep a Sabbath if you want to, but the date and the time is not mandatory. Does that make sense? And the purpose, the purpose of this is just simply to show the resurrection. So if we end up having to have church on Mondays, I don't care. You know, whatever. Just tell me when to show up and I'll let the Lord do whatever he's going to do with me. Um, but that is the logic behind the way we handle the third commandment. Fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. 
This is where I like the Philonian drawing of the tablets more than the Augustinian one, where you had five on one side and five on the other, because, you know, the fifth one was honor your father and mother. You know, um, that's, you know, that's a good thing for us to keep in mind for living in this world. But then again, Augustine, I guess, got it right, too, because, well, it should have been over here. He should have done four and six, in my opinion, because all legitimate authority in this world comes from God. As we've noticed studying creation, God is a God of order. That's why natural law works. Gravity is going to keep going for a while. Moral law is the same way, and in order to impose that, he works through what we call the kingdom of the right. I'm going to re reverse my hands here because I'm facing you. And the kingdom of the left. i got to really think about this now. <laughs> The kingdom of the right is the church. This is what we're doing this morning. It's where the gospel is preached. It's where people are coming to saving faith. So that's ruled um, through our word and sacrament and stuff like that. The kingdom of the left are the secular organizations that keep order in this world. The government, police officers, firefighters, judges, magistrates, all these people, you know, juries, you know, something. I, I, I'm serious. I'm I'm concerned because it's been, over the last 20 years in my life, it's just been a slow erosion of personal liberty. It's like nobody sees it coming. And I'm, I'm starting to get concerned because I'm going to find myself on one of those watch lists, not because I'm out to blow up buildings or anything, but because I would dare stand in a class like this or even put it out on the Internet that I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. I mean, that's scandalous in our culture today. Look at our politicians and what they're doing. They're trying to people in... Finland for that, right? Exactly. Now. And that's why I'm freaking out about freezing assets in Canada. I know Canada's another nation, but there are people over here taking notes. You know, why don't we freeze the assets of people who spread false information online? What freaks me out is we have not seen false information in newspaper reporting until COVID. And the only other place I've seen that in my life has been reading things like Pravda or other communist publications. Somebody accusing someone, an enemy of the state of false information. Now we've got that language in our press. Eesh, I don't know. Um, so we got to take care of that. But while we live in this world, even if the Lord wants us to have a totalitarian, dictatorial, socialistic, ridiculous North Korea even bad style regime we obey the authorities and we follow the law in so much as it does not conflict with God's revealed will aka the Bible and that is our way of worshiping God now you look at some of the people in our government right now and you're thinking oh my gosh if these people are from God what was he thinking? I mean, some of them are real, hmm. I mean, you literally wonder if they've got it all together. <clears throat> and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to put anybody down or anything, but from a layman's point of view out here, you two, I'm looking at these people going, oh, at least some of these people look a little nuts. Well, John Calvin, we don't agree with everything he said, obviously. We don't like his tulip model. He was the guy behind Calvinism, you know, Presbyterian and Reformed. We don't do Reformed thinking so much in the Lutheran church, but we agree with him on, on many things, including this point. When God gives a nation, when God is angry with the people, he gives a nation a bad government. <laughs> you know, So maybe what we're seeing in Washington is a reflection of the fact that we have sinned against a holy God. And part of his way of starting to deal with us is giving us the leaders that we have. I mean, that's scary. So what do we do? We, we, we repent. That's what we do. You know, We're not going to vote these people out, especially if God's putting them in there. I know, the last election was stolen. I get that. But, you know, however this happens, you know, sort of thing. So we're definitely not going to, we're definitely not going to vote them out. Um, but the change that has to happen in our country starts with us. We got to change our hearts. We got to change our little church. From there, it spreads out through Christendom. We're the ones who have allowed this. I have heard in my career horror stories of church discipline gone wrong. You know, but I'm always hearing it from the people who got kicked out of church. So is that a good source or not? But I have, I have not served a church that has ever actually practiced church discipline. And what's the point of church discipline? Well, 
it's to get people to repent. It's not to be angry, and it's not like a power move like the Catholic Church. We're excommunicating you. You're going to go to hell because you don't follow our teachings. It's like, look, man, this is what the Bible teaches. You've told us you're not intent on living this way. We can't have fellowship with you until the circumstance changes. We'll pray for you. We love you. But until this circumstance changes, you're out of the church. That's the attitude that we're supposed to have when we excommunicate people. Sometimes that may or may not happen, let's be honest, because people can get judgmental, which is what Jesus was against when he was saying, judge not. But he wasn't telling us to shut off our minds. And, if, and this is where I wish my sermon would have continued, because in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, okay, you kicked the guy out. Now he's really sorry. You ought to let him back in. <laughs> you know? And that's the attitude we should have, too. You know, you're right. I was living the wrong thing. I want to repent and come back. Okay, come back in now. That's the way this is supposed to work. Um, but we haven't done that. I don't think anywhere in Protestantism, have we? I mean, where, where, are we, where do you hear people getting kicked out of churches these days? You hear people leaving. You hear people forming their own churches. But you don't hear people, I don't know. We, and the thing is, we need to hold each other accountable. You guys are supposed to be holding me accountable for what I do, for heaven's sake. I'm not allowed to re reverse that, you know. And as a body, we're not supposed to come together and say, hey, this is what we teach, preach, and confess. This is how we're supposed to live. And you're not doing that. You know, can we talk about this type of thing? We can't lovingly prod, uh, prod each other into doing the good that we ought to do and avoiding the evil we ought to avoid. That's part of the game, and we're not doing it. But I have digressed, and I'm sorry, but that's, you know, when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with authority. And all authority starts in the home. Honor your father and mother. I mean, you can tell <laughs> whether a child is going to go the right way or not based on the reaction of the parents. You don't want to be too harsh with them. You don't want to provoke the children to wrath. So we are told in Scripture. But at the same time, there's got to be something there. And we disobey when the authorities ask us to do something that is contrary to God's will. And we limit our disobedience to that particular issue. The biblical model is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You guys know those people? I had to learn them in second grade. I went to Lutheran parochial school, and we put on a musical. And I can still remember the songs we had to sing. Shadrach. What kind of name is that Meshach? Who has a name like that? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, oh, oh. oh no. Sounds pretty 70s, right? Because that's what it was, you know. <laughs> and it was. It was a really fun song, you know, stuff like that. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Jewish people living in Babylon because Babylon had captured Jerusalem and Judea and all that. So these were people, probably eunuchs, who were high up in the kingdom, they had been given administrative positions in the Babylonian government. Nebuchadnezzar rolls around. He decides to build this huge golden statue of himself. And he says, when you hear the music, you bow down to the things, you worship the statue. If you don't, I'm going to throw you in a furnace. And it seems like a reasonable thing for a despot to do, right? So he does that. And, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were some of those top guys. I mean, Jewish people were super cool administrators in Babylon. I mean, they, they were relied upon. And they said, oh, king, live forever. That's how you addressed the king back in those days. We'll do anything you ask but this one thing because our God forbids it. And, you know, it's like, you hear God strong enough to save you from the fire? They said, we think he is, but even if he's not, you know, we're going to serve him anyway. That's the attitude we should all have as Christians. I it haven't had it all my life either. It wasn't if he's strong enough to save them. It was if he doesn't decide to save them. There you go. Thank yeah. you for correcting me on that. That's what they answered. That's right. So, you know, I mean, we should all have that attitude. Okay, so if God decides to save me, that's great. If he doesn't, whatever. I'm going to give my life into his hands anyway. So they don't bow down. All the trumpets blow. They stand up. They go throw them in the furnace. I think it was some kind of brick-making furnace. We don't know what this thing was, but that was the, those are the types of furnaces they had at the time. They heated it up so hot, the Bible says, that the guards who threw them in perished, and it was seven times hotter than usual. The king looks in, and they're walking around there, and there's a fourth person who looks like a son of God, so says the king of Babylon. So he calls them out and says, okay, I goofed on that one. You can worship your God now. Or Daniel, you know, Daniel's not supposed to pray. They, he was another high up administrator, likely a eunuch in, in, the, in the government. The other people got jealous. Let's pass a law that says you can't pray on certain times. So he's praying in his normal time. They arrest him. They throw him in the lion's den. Lions don't eat him. <laughs> Comes out. They throw the guys in who accused him because the king did not like the treachery. He says the, their bodies never even hit the ground. The lions got him in midair, you know, type of thing, just <laughs> type of thing. Um, 
Those are our models for civil disobedience. We don't burn down buildings. We don't run around doing weird destructive protests. Right? But we make it clear we're not going to obey this law and we are willing to suffer the consequences for it. And we limit our, our disobedience to the one specific issue. This came into very serious play in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, because we are the Lutheran denomination in North America that has the most African American members. For whatever reason, German people and African Americans get along real good. I know this from my grandparents immigrating in, you know, sort of thing. I mean, a lot of friendships there. It just, it just works type of thing. So we had a lot of African American churches in the South. Uh, yeah, African American Lutherans, they do actually exist. And when the civil rights rolls around, naturally they want to participate in the civil rights movement and the demonstrations and, you know, all of the things that African Americans in the South were doing at that time. So the Synod and its Commission on Theology and Church Relations looked into the matter and figured what are the limits to civil disobedience and wrote several documents, which I think are very good and are still very useful to this day. And that's how African American Lutherans participated in the civil rights movement, um, is following these guidelines. We will, we will do anything else the government requires of us, but on these issues we believe to be contrary to scripture, we're not gonna do anything and we are willing to accept the consequences. And they did. And the civil rights movement was by and large successful, I would say. Um, so this is where we in this denomination have had personal experience with that. So that's where we go with the uh, fourth commandment. And obviously, you know, roles change over time. Parents get older. Sometimes the child becomes the caregiver. Was it Aristotle, I think, who said once an adult, twice a child? Or was it Plato? I don't know. But, you know, so if you're dealing with a parent with dementia, obviously if they're asking you to take them out and throw them in the water, you don't do that type of thing. You disobey under those circumstances. But again... It's with love, it's respect, and it's with keeping within the boundaries of the particular issue. Does that make sense? Okay, very important stuff here. I fear the fourth commandment is going to be the hot topic for the 21st century amongst Christians because it's getting harder out there to be a Christian. I mean, you guys know that. I mean, it's just, it's just getting weird. I must take a breath. I must slow down because now we get to the fifth and the sixth commandments. These are the ones that give problems to our society, and these are the ones I usually spend a day lecturing on. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not, um, and you guys can certainly prod me to do more, but you can see how these two issues are our culture, essentially. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor and his body, but help and, and support him in every physical need. And boy, are we a murdering country. The Catholics are right. We totally agree with the Catholics in that we live in a culture of death. And if you study life issues and you look at the legislation that's being passed or how people are trying to do the ethics on who gets to by what level of insurance for what price or whatever, and all these sorts of things. How involved should the government be in, in life and end of life decisions? What are the law, what the laws should be and stuff like that? We do not value human life in the Western world. That's just a simple fact. I didn't accept that fact until about five years ago myself, but I looked into it and it's true. We just, human beings are expendable. There are 7 billion of us on the planet, and the powers that be think we don't matter. Even though, ironically, we're the ones that gave them all their money by all our labor, or they took it from us, however that works out. But they don't, they don't seem to acknowledge that. But we live in a culture that does not value human life, and that shows up in the newspaper literally every day. And the sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. This is the birds and the bees thing, all right? We should fear and love God so that we lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do, and husband and wife love and honor each other. Of all the complaints I've ever had, except for that one guy who said he'd leave the church if I ever preached about money, I think he's probably just looking for an out. I mean, really, because you know a preacher's going to get around it eventually. I mean, I have never had anybody come into my office and complain about a sermon that wasn't revolving around the Sixth Commandment. 
Nobody's ever come in my office and said, Pastor, that sermon on you shall not steal, man, that is so first century. You are out of times. You don't understand ethics. People live differently today. Greed is good. You got to get with it. You're going to drive people away if you say you shall not steal. Nobody's ever complained about that. Or, you know, honor your father and mother. Man, that is so old-fashioned. You can't preach on that. No, every time anybody has ever preached, and the only time anybody I'm aware of has ever left this church, it's been a sixth commandment issue. Human sexuality. Look at our culture. We are obsessed with sex. I mean, even during the Second World War, the English were complaining. The problem with the Americans is they were overfed, oversexed, and over here. You know, I mean, it just, you know, go home, America. Yankee, go home. Even our allies were saying that. You know, it's like these guys, you know, it's like Marlene Dietrich, and she is a little in herself. She said, you know, sex for, the re for Americans is obsession. For the rest of the world, it's a fact. You know, there's something about our culture that's a little weird with human sexuality. And so it tends to strike a little deeper than perhaps it does, or a little differently perhaps it does in the rest of the world. Um, my grandparents on my mom's side immigrated from Germany in 1925. I mean, I was raised you know, by my parents and also by first generation immigrants. They talked about sex differently. They, they, there wasn't a difference in morality, but there was just an attitude difference there than from other people in the culture around us. It's a weird thing. And that gets into our churches and somehow we need to deal with it. So it's these two commandments that people seem to pay attention to more. I mean, they all apply. You shall not steal. I mean, that means, you know, you're not supposed to shirk your responsibility as an employee. I mean, that applies to everybody. Or you shall not bear false witness. You know, quit saying lies about your neighbor. In the age of Facebook and Twitter, that obviously applies. I thought that might be the sin of the 21st century. I don't know. But that's not where people's focus is. It's on these two commandments. And so I feel compelled to unpack them with a little bit more detail than I might otherwise. So, first thing to note about the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. That is a better translation of the Hebrew word. There are 11 words for taking a life in Hebrew. Murder is a good thing because it means unlawful killing. You shall not kill is not the best translation for the 21st century. Um, it was good for King James' time, but people had a different understanding of the word kill. And you know, nowadays we think kill, you know, that's why people are vegans, because they don't want to kill animals or whatever type of thing. Um, you know, that's, but that's not the way the Bible reads. You shall not murder is a better translation. Therefore, there are times when we can take a human life. Which I did that with the confirmation class this year. It's probably on tape somewhere. And so I wrote on the board... Okay, so they, they got their attention. You know, good way to deal with 13-year-olds. So maybe I'll do that here. I'll even say someone. There we go. We'll make it, we'll make it gen, gender inclusive. You know, we can murder male, female, whatever type of thing here. Um, because there are places in our culture where that can happen. The first one is in lawful self-defense. That's always been a recognition in our culture and in every culture. Human beings fight for their own lives. So if you're being attacked with lethal force... Uh, you can, according to the laws of the land, use lethal force, um, you know, to protect yourself. That's, that's reasonable. That's fair. Even if the laws are different, like some kind of weird duty to retreat law or something like that, you may suffer the consequences for your actions, but we believe you have the moral high ground in protecting yourself or other people. <laughs> so, you know, you may go to prison for it because you've got weird state laws, but we don't see it. It's not sinful if you're in a, truly in a situation where this is necessary that we use um, that you use you know lethal force. In fact, in some places it's codified in the law. If you attack a person over 65 years of age, for example, or a woman, <laughs> we've had court precedents where they can pull out a gun and shoot somebody because of the size and strength disparity. You know, most men are 40% stronger than most women, on average, you know, so you get a really big guy going up against a really big woman, you know, there, there are juries that are going to let her off the hook for shooting him, you know, and likewise with an elderly person. So, um, so lawful self-defense. Another thing that's obvious is capital punishment. Yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> Whatever. I wouldn't have gotten as far in life without spell checkers, so there we go. Paul says in Romans that the governor does not bear the sword in vain. We recognize that God has given the kingdom of the left, the state, the ability to execute criminals. So you cannot be a functioning Christian and say that God opposes the death penalty. You can question whether the death penalty is being properly applied in your country. And I admit there are days I wonder that myself when I look at some of the stories about who gets on death row. But we cannot say thou shalt not kill applies to governments because that's just simply not true. Uh, criminals can be executed. Capital punishment. And the third is prosecution of a just war. So we ought to talk a little bit about the concept of a just war. It's even gotten thrown around in this century, you know, because politicians have wanted to uh, legitimize invading Afghanistan or Iraq or whatever. I love what happened when Bush was speaking after the towers came down. We're going after the axis of evil. <laughs> uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and North Korea. North Korea's like, whoa, whoa, where, where'd this come from? We didn't do anything with this. You know, it shows us a little bit of our American empirical attitude at the time. Well, we'll attack North Korea for this. Uh, fortunately, we did not. But I think that's because our politicians and think tank folks and leaders realized that we would not pass the just war test. So what is a just war? The concept of a just war goes back to the time of St. Augustine. So we're talking 4th century, okay? Um, to have a just war, where should I put it? I'll put it over here. The first thing, and this is where it actually entered in our political rhetoric, is it must have a just cause. Usually, although I would argue not always, usually that's defensive in nature, either the defense of the home front or the defense of someone else. And that was our pretext, that's been our pretext for several wars in the 20th century. Um, I'm not against all war, by the way, but I am, I am critical. You know, the last truly legit war I think this nation fought in, World War II, possibly Korea. I've got some real issues with Vietnam, and I'm not knocking Vietnam vets or anything. I mean, I think we sent our soldiers out on an impossible mission in Vietnam. I think that's the problem. That's why I think it doesn't pass just war muster, in my opinion. And I think we started doing that again with our soldiers in Afghanistan, especially, you know. When you start having people there without it, without desired outcomes and prolonged occupations, and or you give them kill quotas or stuff like that, or you, or you can bomb the fuel truck there, but you can't hit the uh, factory on the way out as you're flying out over North Vietnam. These are moral problems in war. They're not just tactical problems. They're moral problems because you're not giving the soldiers the abil ability to do their job. But it has to start with a just cause, usually defensive. I say usually why because I have a lot of self-defense training, um, a lot of firearms training and stuff like that. And the fact of the matter is, all things being equal in a fight, especially a gunfight, usually the first person who shoots wins. Usually, not always. I mean, people kill each other, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, usually the first one to strike wins. And that's true, that's true whether you're talking about uh, two people in an alley at night or two battleships out on the ocean type of thing. So I do leave room in my own thinking for a... Um, for a preemptive strike, if we have good, if we have good solid knowledge that the Soviets are going to launch their missiles, we should launch first, type of thing. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe this is there's a good reason I'm not in the Defense Department. I'm down here in Titusville, but you know, I'd be one of those war hawks in the Kennedy board. You know, oh, okay, they, the, the Russians are in Cuba. Let's get them now. Let's get them now. I do think there is some legitimate place for that, but man, you got to be careful with that because your intel needs to be right on. You're right on with that and. We've seen how governments can manipulate intelligence agencies. But a just cause is usually defensive. We can't just go invade Mexico because we need to do target practice or something. I don't know. Or, or Cuba. Let's just go take over Cuba. Why? Because our army needs something to do. Or, you know, I like their cigars or whatever. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. A just, a just cause, it must be um, prosecuted fairly. This is called the rule of proportionality. You use as much force as is necessary to do the job. So, I don't know, 
Nicaragua declares war on us. Let's go drop an atom bomb on them. No, we don't need to do that. I mean, they, they, we could probably defeat them with sound guns or something. You know, we don't have to. If we send in the Marines, we'll lose a few lives. We'll kill a few of them. But we're not going to destroy the entire country, wipe out all the men, women, and children if we don't have to. So prosecuted fairly. You know, we want to minimize as much unnecessary damage because then it goes beyond the point of fairness, you know, and um, doing what's actually done, the purpose of the war. It must be winnable. This is my problem with the Vietnam War. Or must have a reasonable chance for success. That would be the better way to say that, but I get the word winnable. We did not, because the Johnson administration was intent upon limiting the scope of American involvement, we set our soldiers up, in my opinion, for fail. They, they won a lot on the battlefield. I mean, they did great. But when you start saying, oh, you, know, you can't just go into Saigon and take over, which if we would have done that, we would have stopped the whole thing. Or like, you know, um, MacArthur saying, let's go bomb China and then we can get the Chinese out of the war and we can take back North Korea. <clears throat> We never let our soldiers finish what they started. And to me, that's a problem. And maybe you see it differently, I don't know. Again, I'm not, I'm lamenting the use of our forces because I think a lot of pe young men died and bled for nothing because if you had just let them go win the war, you know, but they didn't do that. Um, so it has to be winnable. Needless to say, for it to be winnable, it has to be a war of last resort. In other words, this is the only way to solve this problem. And of course, politicians and other leaders are going to debate this ad infinitum forever. <laughs> you know, is this a, give sanctions just a little more time to work? Well, I don't know if sanctions would have worked on Adolf Hitler. You know, he was out doing his own thing anyway. <laughs> you know, Hitler, by the way, is a quintessential politician. I, mean, I, have pers I don't have personal experience. My family does because they were living in Germany in the Second World War. He, he was popular. Oh my gosh, he was popular. He wasn't popular because of all the parades. That was all theater, and most people were like, yeah, whatever. He's down in Nuremberg. He was popular because he actually did what he said he would do. He brought that if he was made chancellor, there would be no more muggings in, in Germany. And this was a thing for my great grandparents because they were elderly. Depressions going on in Germany. Old people were getting mugged. So Hitler instituted the death penalty for muggings. Muggings in Germany stopped overnight. I mean, just dead. Don't, you don't mess with the Nazis. They say, you do this, we're going to kill you. It's like a very popular guy. So I've always wondered, beware of the politician who keeps his word. I don't know. You know, it's, it's one of those things. But it was just crazy stuff. And what saddens me about Hitler now that I'm on a bunny trail is, you know, everybody talks about those evil Nazis and the Germans and social. Nobody sees that the pattern by which Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, and all these other guys came to power is being put into play in our country right now. Nobody sees that. It's so frustrating. And, you know, the Canadians are getting in both barrels of it right now. All you got is a bunch of truckers who don't want to take their vaccine, you know, for heaven's sakes, you know. Wow, an <laughs> emergency power is that. Go, go Trudeau, burn the Reichstag, will you? I mean, that's just crazy. But this is the movement right now in Western civilization is towards totalitarianism. So again, fourth commandment might get very interesting for us. Can you give just a couple of examples of how you mean our country is becoming like that? Like in the taking down of the statues, that kind of thing? I mean, what? Taking down of statues concerns me, yes. And the reason for that is, this is my, again, my family's not from here, okay? I, I was born in Ocala, so I consider myself a southerner. You know, I'm not a Yankee. Sorry, guys. You know, I'm, I'm one of these Johnny Rebs down here. But when the Civil War ended, there was a tremendous push to reconcile. It was started by the Lincoln administration. You know, they, they didn't, you know, shoot enemy troops who were trying to barter with, you know, Union troops or whatever. They, you know, send them, we'd send them coffee, they'd send them tobacco, you know, however that works out type of thing. And so, you know, when, when Grant defeats Lee, he just sends the troops home. He doesn't imprison them or do weird things to him or hold, hold Nuremberg-style trials or whatever. There was a tremendous attempt to reconcile. And part of the Southern psyche trying to come to grips with the horrors of the war and the fact that they found themselves on an immoral side of history because it 
I don't think it was initially about slavery. I mean, slavery was a part. I don't want to say it wasn't slavery, but that wasn't it. You know what I'm saying? It was more to... I don't think the average white guy with a rifle at Vicksburg was sitting going, I'm going to do this to keep all the black people in line. I don't... You know, there was more... It was a deeper... I think it was a deeper issue than that. And so part of the Southern Reconstruction was <laughs> statues going up and all kinds of you know folklore and stuff. And this was tolerated because there was an attempt to keep the country together. And what I see happening with statues removing is a removal of that toleration. I mean, for heaven's sakes, I mean, the, in West Point, they're still talking about Lee and his strategies. I mean, you know, these, these guys were colleagues who got into this fight. Even Robert E. Lee, I mean, he fought for Virginia because that was his home state. You know, he was offered command of the Union Army. He, he decided to go to Virginia. I mean, this, this was a very complicated matter. It wasn't as black and white as it's being made today, in my opinion. And I think it's being made black and white because it is an attempt to divide us. You divide the culture, then you bring in a strong political party or government to take control. Back in the 1960s, the Marxists out at UCLA, the college teachers already teaching 1960s, that's why I think we, we got a problem. They realized they were not going to be able to use the Marx, Engels, Lenin stuff about capitalism. You know, workers of the world unite. The workers in America were quite happy, thank you very much. They didn't feel the need to unite with anybody or overthrow their bosses who were making them nice and rich. So they said, we'll take a different tact. We will use race as our dividing point. Because, you know, you had the civil rights stuff going on in the 60s. You guys were there. I wasn't, you know. Had to wait a little bit for me to come on the scene. And so that's where critical race theory comes from. Critical race theory is an attempt to divide this nation based along racial lines. Amen. And you attack white people because white people are the majority. That's, that's all there is to it. It's not even personally against white people because the goal is not racial equality. Like the goal of Marxism is not economic equality. You say these things to get people fired up so that you get into power. Nobody in the Soviet Union, after three generations, thought that they were interested in the workers of the world anymore. Because, you know, you either rise to the communist ranks or you don't. Sort of like China right now. You're either good at playing the Chinese party or you're not. Or like Nazi Germany. You're either good at, you know, working with the Nazis or you weren't. And if you worked with the Nazis, it didn't matter what your personal beliefs were, you were rich. You know, that's how it worked in those days. That's how it's starting to work here. That's the system they're trying to put into place. Another practical example is when you hear stories in the news about how, like, a, out somewhere in the Midwest, not Midwest, the Pacific Northwest, you find pamphlets explaining how 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a racist statement. That is literally from Mao Zedong, because they did that in China. They said 2 plus 2 equals 4 is a bourgeois statement. See, they were able to do it from the economic side. We have to do communism from the racist side because we're so wealthy. You know, everybody, nobody in America feels impoverished enough to overthrow the government. You know, it's just, it's just a, so you use race as that barrier instead. So anywhere you see, another practical is that I'm watching Frontline on PBS about the history of Levi's jeans. And all they're doing is talking about the poor black people who had to wear blue jeans. That is somewhat legitimate because in those days, Denim was considered a Negro fabric. That's what it was called in the press. So, yeah, you want to touch on that. But when you start hearing phrases like, now that we're more equal, or in the 1930s, blue jeans was the great equalizer because there was so much oppression between the rich and the poor. We don't talk that way like Americans. And yet you've got people on PBS talking that way. At least I don't talk that way as an American. I don't see the 1930s as a difference between the ultra-rich exploiting the ultra-poor. That's a Marxist point of view. So these types of thinking are coming in. Like I mentioned a moment ago, this, you know, the fact that we're being censored, even by private corporations, is alarming. Who did, you know, it used to be, in my lifetime, Americans made up their own mind. We looked at the facts for ourselves. Now we're being told what to think, and that's being enforced. I don't know, I could keep going, but I'm off track here. You see what I'm saying? I see it all over the place, and it's worse. You know, just look at how Trudeau is treating the truckers. I mean, that's... He suspended Parliament yesterday. I mean, holy cow. I mean, that's what Hitler did. You know, holy cow. The most blatant I see is when they say it's a woman's right if she wants to kill her baby. Mm -hmm. Yet, because it's her body. Yet, mm -hmm. you will be vaccinated. It's not your body. Exactly. You know, it's, it's the hypocrisy <laughs> of the whole thing. Because it's not about your body. It's about who's in control. Exactly. And that's where we see the problem. 
So I don't know. I, like I said, I could go on and on and on, and I'd have to think a little more clearly. And if you wanted me to document this, yeah, I could do it. But look, but that's I see it coming. Just turn the camera off. Yeah. It scares me, you know, <laughs> because I'm on the chopping block for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm an intellectual. You know, I have a master's degree, so they're going to come after the people who, who can think through these things, who can reason their way through an argument. That's what that's what the Khmer Rouge did under Pol Pot. You know, they just killed off all the, the intellectual class. I'm a clergyman, and that means I'm a double problem. You know, I'm a triple problem in that I'm a conservative clergyman. You know, I'm a, I'm a quadruple problem in that I understand American history and actually believe in our, our ideals. And I understand what the heck's going on out there. That, that makes me a threat. So I'm going to be one of the first ones to go. And I just, I just know that. So, you know, <laughs> you all can jump God's to a different work. church if you want, but I'm gone. <laughs> you know? Doing God's work, you're just talking his words. Okay. That's it. I mean, that's what I'm going to keep doing because that's really the only safe course of action, really. And if I die, well, at least I don't have to live under totalitarianism. You know, I was born a free personally, so I think I was, and I very much enjoy the opportunity to remain a free person for the rest of my life, no matter how short that may be. Um, then I'll get killed in a car accident on the way home today, it won't matter. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, well. so back to the fifth commandment here. Um, because of the fourth commandment, and because of the way we've laid these things out since at least the time of St. Augustine, we believe it is a Christian's obligation to participate in just wars, as it is a Christian's obligation to participate in capital punishment and lawful self-defense and stuff like that. If you want to be a conscientious objector, that's fine. You know, if you just can't see yourself pulling the trigger on an enemy, most people have a real problem with that. It's real hard to get most soldiers to shoot another soldier. It takes a lot of effort. I mean, they did some kind of study in the Vietnam War of all the ammunition expended and how much of it actually reached the targets. And they came to the conclusion that most soldiers were firing over the enemy's heads. I mean, <laughs> and you know, at such a rate that they considered it intentional. I mean, that's how, of course, that's also why they made, they changed the trigger mechanism on the uh, M16 platform. But anyways, that's another story. Uh, but it's, it's hard to do that. So if, if, you, if you want to do a more peaceful role, that's fine. But otherwise, we are obligated to participate in so long as it does not violate God's word. Does that make sense? So there we go. Um, other issues under the fifth commandment, because you'll see <coughs> we should fear and love God so we don't hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every need. This also goes to the welfare of our neighbor. So anything that harms our neighbor is off the table. Abortion, or I should say unnecessary abortion. Now, the qualification I don't even know how to spell that. I'm just going to put that there. Um, the qualification is if you could genuinely prove that the mother is going to lose her life carrying this child, our theologians might consider it the lesser of two evils to abort the baby. We've never actually run into that situation before, though. So, you know, it's a, it's, it remains, at least among Lutherans, a theoretical construct. And you got the stories of people like Tim Tebow who were supposed to be aborted. Look, they turned out just fine. And there are countless stories of that. So you could say unnecessary abortion, but we generally are against abortion because we don't want to harm the fetus. And because, as I explained earlier, because Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, we believe that life begins at conception. So while the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod will currently allow for the use of contraception, we don't want abortive contraceptives, the things that would cause a woman to eject a fertilized egg, because that's contrary to our beliefs. And there's all kinds of debate, and you know, I had a lot of fun because I had a couple of gynecologists in my last congregation, and you know, okay, so interuterine devices, how do they work? Ah, but you consider yourself a good Lutheran, so how do you answer this? And we go back and forth on this. And there are just some things we don't know. I mean, they, they, they'll shove all kinds of things into a woman and it worked and she doesn't get pregnant, but they don't know the mechanism. We need to know the mechanism. So when in doubt, go without. I mean, it's, the command is to be fruitful and multiply anyway. And so if God decides to bring an extra child into your life, whoop de thrill I mean, one of the reasons Western culture is dying is because of birth control. You know, our, our, the only reason we have a 2.1 uh, reproductive ratio in our cultures because we're allowing illegal immigrants in the country. That's another thing people don't know. Why do they keep the southern border open? Because we have both aborted and contracepted ourselves out of people. 
you know, I love back when I was in college, you know, I'd hear all the politicians say, they're taking the jobs Americans don't want, which I thought was utter BS, because I know a lot of guys who'd like to be carpenters or, you know, bricklayers or whatever sort of thing. So I thought that was, utter... I came to realize in seminary when I started running the math, no, they're not taking the jobs Americans don't want. They're taking the jobs Americans don't exist to fulfill because we have not reproduced at a rate big enough to sustain our economy. You know, I mean, that's just reality. And Japan's even worse. They're like at 1.8. So it's, it, Japan is a dying elderly culture and we are not far behind. So this is why I don't think the southern border is going to get closed for, for real anytime soon because it, it would destroy our economy and we don't have laws in place that allow people to emigrate at a speed fast enough to prop us up from our sinful, abortive, and contraceptive practices. I know that's crazy, right? But this is, this is my analysis of the situation. If we, if we were still having four or five kids per family, that board would be sealed up tight. There'd be no question about it. We wouldn't be hiring illegal immigrants. You know, There might be tax advantages to it, but I mean, you, you've got a work pool right here that we do not have because of the way we've been living for the last 70 years. So we're against abortion and abortive contraceptives. Also, euthanasia. You know what that is. It's not, I mean, it's not the teenagers over in Hong Kong. It's the end of life. <laughs> you know? I've had to explain that to people. It took me a second. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> When your schnauzer gets a little old, they start walking in circles and can't feed themselves and lose all bowel and bladder control, you take them to the vet and you put them to sleep. I say that flippantly. I mean, it hurts to do that. I had to do that with my dog of 15 years, you know, but, but that's the way we treat animals. It's considered the humane thing to do. Well, what we do now, what people are proposing now is let's do that with people, you know. <laughs> let's say take old Grandpa Phil over here or whatever he is. He, He's got dementia. He doesn't know what's going on anyway. He's not contributing to society. He's costing society more, especially if the government's paying for his health care or the taxpayers. So we'll just, uh, we'll just take him to one of these clinics like they modeled for us in the movie Soylent Green. I love that movie, by the way. You know, and we'll just put, we'll get on the, we'll put on the classical music and turn on the picture of the birds flying and we'll put him to sleep. People are proposing that. You know what freaked me out? When I first came here, I got a call to go visit somebody in the hospital on the hospice wing. This is over at Parrish. And this person wasn't a member of the church, but they were crying out for a Lutheran clergyman. So I went over there. I walk in there. The lights are down low. There's beautiful pictures on the TV. And there's classical music playing in the background. And I'm sitting there going, oh, no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I went green. Here we go. So I said my piece and got out of there. You know, did my little whatever. Um, but that's what people are seriously proposing. We're, we're, we're not for that. Um, we're just not for that. God is the creator of life, and it's to be ended by him. Now, you run into situations where somebody might be brain dead, you've got a loved one on a feeding tube, you know, you've got something breathing for them. When do you pull the plug type of thing? Um, that becomes a bit more challenging because it seems like our technology has overrun our ability to think through some of these things. And a lot of people feel tremendous guilt whichever side they take on that. Our best advice is to prayerfully consider these things and go with the best information you have. Um, but we don't just decide that a person's useless anymore and pull the plug because we want to save the insurance company money or ourselves money or whatever type of thing. There's, there's a difference in attitude there. Um, and I can say it's, it's hard no matter which direction you take. Uh, suicide. Suicide used to be considered the unforgivable sin. That actually rose in the Middle Ages. I don't think the early Christians thought that way. In fact, there were plenty of early Christians who committed suicide, especially young women. They were virgins. They took their virginity seriously. Here come the Romans into town, going to rape them and mess them up, so they just committed suicide. They were considered heroes in the early church, so I don't know if that was a wise move on their part or not. I'm not saying it's good or bad. But the point is that the Romans the Christians did not look down on them for that particular course of action. It appears to be in the Middle Ages where we have this teaching that suicide is a direct path to hell. We no longer teach that because we realize nowadays suicide is a little bit more nuanced of a situation. Sometimes people are not in control of their faculties, for example. Well, that's, I, I'm not going to say someone's going to hell just because they're crazy. You know, that doesn't work that way. Uh, uh, but we still try to discourage it, the unnecessary taking of one's own life. 
unlike the guy who throws himself on a grenade to save his buddies in war or something like that. So in that line of thinking, Judas necessarily is not in hell because he committed suicide. He's in hell because he betrayed the Lord. If he's in hell, if it's because he did not accept Christ's forgiveness. <clears throat> and when Lutherans argue that Judas is in hell, it's because they're saying his actions prove that he didn't want, to, want Christ's forgiveness. I don't like to play, I don't like to mind read Judas. So for me, it's an open question. But um, traditionally, that's what we've thought. And that would be why. Um, so we're against, I would I call this unnecessary or selfish suicide. Um, oh gosh, what am I leaving out here? Um, misuse of <laughs> human bodies. I mean, you know, we've got all these frozen embryos. What on earth are we going to do with these things? So we generally discourage, try to discourage embryonic stem cell research because we can get stem cells from other places um, and do just as well. But what do we do with the vats of embryos we've got all over the country? This is, this is a real problem for Christian couples because they, they get into fertility treatment because they want to be parents. They don't realize what's involved. All of a sudden, they've got a half a dozen embryos sitting in some clinic somewhere. They've had their kids. They're on their way in life. And then they start to wonder ethical questions. And that's something else we pastors have to sometimes help try and help people sort out. It's like, did we do the right thing here? What do we do with the embryos? Stuff like that. I mean, it, it, it can be a mess. Um, our medical technology seems to have superseded our ability to teach about it in the church. Maybe it's time for us to change that. Um, so we're, we have issues like that. Also, just general welfare. Um, I'm going to answer this. Say what? Cloning. Cloning. Hmm. That's a tough one. Because the question becomes, does the clone have a soul? Well, if it's human, yeah. And where does it come from? But I don't know. That's a tough one. I'm going to have to look at that. We just recently did a Bible study. No, not for me. I don't believe in it. I, I think some people are playing God when they do that. It's very challenging. I mean, you know, why why would you mess with the genetics in your in your in your system if you've got a baby? I mean, if you can eliminate a very bad disease, I can see the argument. But if you just want to have blue eyes, exactly. I don't know. That's that's a tough thing. We do get into that, and now we have the technology to modify DNA on the fly. So there are a lot of issues. On the one hand, it's great that we have the technology. On the other hand. We're sinful human beings, and technology seems to allow us to, it's like caffeine, allowing people to make stupid mistakes faster, you know, for a hundred, <laughs> couple hundred years. That's about what our technology is doing. Now we can do more dumb things more quickly. So, you know, that's the way I read a meme one time, you know, caffeine allowing stupid people to you know, make bad decisions more quickly, you know. <laughs> so I don't know. I, whenever I go on these diet kicks, I get off caffeine. So that's why I'm dragging a little bit today, perhaps. So I don't know why I think I lose weight when I don't drink caffeine. But maybe, I'm, maybe it's right. I don't know. Um, so these are some of the issues under the fifth commandment. But help and support them in every physical need. There is a place where we take care of our neighbor. And this is so profound. And I'll wrap up here in the next five minutes. And we'll talk about, what did I call it today? The birds and the bees? Okay, we'll talk about that next week. And hopefully get through the other commandments, too. I, I have great hopes. But it was the early church that created the hospital system, the hospice system as well, uh, uh, um, orphanages, schools, things of that nature. Because the Roman world, the logical stoical thing to do is to take care of yourself. You see a beggar sitting by the side of the road, don't feed him, according to Roman thinking. He obviously cannot support himself. If you feed him, not only are you prolonging his misery, but you're taking money out of your own pocket, which could be used for the betterment of your family, which will go on and contribute to society. So it's better for society to let the beggar starve. It's better for the beggar to let the beggar starve. It's better for you to let the beggar starve because you're not wasting your money on a bad bet. Christians didn't have that morality, though. So we started feeding people. Babies, you know, they, they had abortion in the ancient world, but they also just had it. The baby was born, the father didn't want it because the father was in control of the whole family. The baby would be left outside and abandoned, you know, sort of like Romulus and Remus. They were a couple of abandoned twins, supposedly raised by a she wolf. That's how the city of Rome got started. Maybe a she wolf will come by and take the babies, you know, whatever. That was the, that was the way it was colloquially talked about. <clears throat> but Christians would come by and scoop up the babies. We started making orphanages. In hospitals, hospices, helping people to die with dignity. The Christian church in the West is responsible for all of the social services of the Western world. 
What is different is in the last couple hundred years, we have ceded that role to the government. It used to be the church's prerogative. And our churches were growing like crazy when we were actually taking care of people, feeding the poor, helping people who are sick, you know, adopting babies, whatever the case may be. But we've stepped out of that role. Now the government does that. I think that's a shame because it's going to be very hard if we ever want to reclaim our heritage to step back into that role. I, hey, I'm an Augustinian-style conservative. I used to argue with my co co college professors. They'd be going off on some liberal thing, how we need to raise taxes to feed these people. I'm like, forget about that. You can't do a good job with that. Let the church do it. You know, I, that's why I say we go back and forth in class. The difference is in those days, I got A's in class because I was willing to articulate my views and give the professor a good run for his money. Nowadays, I'd probably get drummed out of class or failed or whatever for not being with the system. But I was at a parochial college, too, so, you know, a different type of thing. But, I, you know, I'm all for it. Get, shrink the government. Get out of people's lives. The worst thing we've done ever for African Americans, in my opinion, was the civil rights legislation of the night. Not the civil rights, but the, what, what was that thing um, that Johnson signed? It just perpetual right welfare. Society. Yeah, the Great Society, Perpetual Welfare. We've got generations of people who never held a job. How on earth can we expect them to survive if we cut off their money? That doesn't make any sense to me. I don't like that they're on it. But it's like feeding, it's like feeding the bears. You know, once you feed them, they can't find their own food. And we've done that to human beings in our culture. It'd be nice if we could break that trend. But if we're going to break that trend, man, the church really needs to step up to the plate because that's going to cost us a lot of money now that we have let other people take care of it. And maybe, just maybe if we took over, we could help people get weaned from the system and actually contribute to society as well. So that'll get me kicked off YouTube for sure. Um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I might as well skip this one. Uh, just skip this one, yeah, it's gone. <laughs> this, put this one behind a paywall or something, you know, just so we get passwords here so you know, the bots don't get it or whatever. <laughs> You're looking at me. Um, I don't do Facebook and all that. Rick Tell is, Rick that, you know, hey, we got a hot one here. This <laughs> one's going to get the FBI involved. So. <laughs> so anyways, that's our take on the fifth commandment. Any thoughts, any questions on that? Have you had the canoe accident with those things the FBI might not want you owning? <laughs> I don't speak of such things. Oh. I prefer I prefer to be interviewed in person. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> you know. Okay. Free people don't ask for permission to own certain things. You know, and that's reality. We have a second amendment for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's not because the deer are going to overrun us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I I hate to say this, but and I, I'm concerned because we've got all these guns in our culture. We've got like six million guns, some ridiculous number, we've got like three guns for every person in the culture, and trillions of rounds of ammunition. But are we actually going to use it when the time comes? That's my concern because I'm looking around, thinking a lot of soft people, and there's a lot of people who are too comfortable living right now. You know, it's gonna, the government's going to have to do something really bad before we shoot them. I mean, that's what it comes down to, I think. And now the British did. I mean, what, you, know, you wonder why the Second Amendment is there. Read the Fourth Amendment about quartering troops. I mean, that explains it all, because the British would come into your home, they'd take your wine, your cattle, and even your women. You know, you wonder what would take good British subjects, colonialists, mad enough to go out and shoot at the world's best army, you know, and start raping their wives. I mean, they don't, they don't care if they live or die. At that point, they're seeing red. That's one of the things that led to our revolution. We were being so abused by the, by the crown that it was better to be fighting and dying than to be subject to our imperial overlords. That's why the change in our culture, I think, is coming on very, very, very slowly. And we're not perceiving the fact that this video, if it was, were to go up, will be monitored. Uh, we're going to be entered into some kind of database. And you know, all these sorts of things, and legislation just creeps in every day. Let's have another school shooting so we can, you know, make it in Florida where 18-year-olds can't own rifles anymore. That's ridiculous. We can send an 18-year-old off to war, but they can't buy a rifle to protect their farm. You know, this is stupid. And the agenda is not, the agenda is not keeping children safe. The agenda is taking guns out of the public, because then they can control us. There is a slight chance, there's a slight chance somebody might actually get shot if we bring in the draconian policies too fast. We don't want that. 
So that's why our culture is doing things the way they are. So here I am and talking to treason. And they also are pushing. I mean, I'm talking about the ineps. Mm -hmm. I, I won't call them elites. They're ineps. Yeah. They're pushing in the hopes that the first shot is fired not by them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we are, for those who are in the know, this is a very interesting cat and mouse game. Yeah. Well, now you're in the know. You have no excuse, and you're labeled because you're hanging. Up. I'm sure I'm in a database somewhere, not because I've ever tried. Probably the same one we're in. So. Yeah, exactly. So there we go. We're all in the database together. So yeah, keep your powder dry. Here we go. <laughs> Let's close with prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the liberty we yet experience. And grant us the wisdom to know how to live in this changing culture, when to fight and when not to, and how best to uphold your kingdom. Keep us safe as we go our separate ways and help us to do the work you prepared for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.